Hi, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this, this presentation is to go over chapters 1 through 4. Ignore that 1 through 8. We'll get to the other parts later. But 1 through 4 of the Scarlet Letter and just point out some of the things that Hawthorne is doing as he creates this story for you. Now we've already talked about chapter one quite a bit. It's this really short chapter. You've got about two pages that basically just describes a door and this bush that's outside of the door. So you have this, all of this imagery, but look at the really specific language choices. Um, this very dark and heavy tone is created. We have this idea that the Puritans came over to set up this paradise uh, kind of perfect colony, but instead they ended up having to build two things that you can't escape if you have humans with you, which is a prison and a graveyard. So underscoring that yes, there is mortality in man and there is also sin in man. So those are the first two kind of images that we get. And then you look at words like dark, gloomy, iron, weather-stained, rust, ugly, unsightly, black, flower, condemned, doomed. And you see all of this with this contrast of this one pop of color. We have this rose bush that's there. And Hawthorne even says to you, the reader has this interesting second person address where he says that I'm going to pluck a flower from the rose bush and hand it to you, the reader, as a little bit of wisdom or moral that you can take away from this story at the end. So we have this very short chapter, but Hawthorne's kind of telling us us how to set up the way to think about this story that he's about to tell. Now chapter two, the marketplace, we meet Hester for the first time. And we're set up first not by seeing her, but by seeing all of the other women. And they're sort of set up as these cold, hard, kind of almost manly. They're, they're all strong and sturdy um, and very judgmental. They're all talking about how Hester got off easy because she's young and she's pretty. And if they had had charge of her, oh boy, they would, they would have seen to it that she were punished for real. And we see our first mention here are some of the other characters that we're going to run into. We see Reverend Dimsdale and told that he's taken it grievously to heart that this young woman who was in his congregation has fallen so far. Um, and then we finally meet Hester, and it says she has two tokens of shame. The first, obviously, is the scarlet letter that they're making her wear, but the other is the baby in her arms. And you're going to hear this over and over and over again, but the baby is the living embodiment of the scarlet letter. And then we see this contrast between Hester and her delicacy and her beauty and the um, kind of harshness of the rest of the crowd there. And there's almost this kind of Madonna imagery that goes on, which seems the opposite of what you'd have because the whole Madonna imagery is the virgin birth and this holiness about it, whereas you have Hester, who's this fallen woman being punished for a sexual sin. But the um, you can kind of tell the author's tone because of the way that he portrays Hester as being still this um, delicate, sympathetic character in the middle of this whole harsh crowd. And when Hester does come out, the crowd goes absolutely silent and just stirs at her. And she says, this is almost worse. She was waiting for people to call her names and waiting for people to throw things, but this just standing there with all these people just looking at her and hating on her is much harder, and she hadn't really prepared herself for that. And then we have this little cliffhanger at the back. She sees somebody in the back of the crowd and has this reaction as she locks eyes with this stranger and we're not really sure as the reader why she's having this strong reaction although we're about to find out. And so chapter three is the recognition and this is why Hester's had such a strong reaction because this man is no other than her presumably dead or gone or missing husband. And he's described when we meet him as being sort of this older guy, he's kind of ugly, he's got those one shoulders kind of higher than the other, he seems sort of misshapen. And when he says Hester, Hawthorne says that this expression rolled across his face like a snake. Now again, Hawthorne is not subtle in his imagery, so if he's telling you that this snake imagery goes with this guy, he's kind of telling you right from the beginning, and if you didn't get the idea of chilling in his name, that maybe this is somebody that you want to watch out for. And he silently from across the crowd shushes Hester, says don't say anything, don't have any kind of reaction, and then sits there and starts to kind of, um, you know, see if he can get gossip out of some strangers there, say what's going on, what's happening, um, and starts having this conversation with this other stranger in the crowd.
And through this conversation with the stranger, we learned that um, he's been shipwrecked, that he was on a ship heading from England over to the New World, and he got lost at sea. He managed to get his way to the shore, and he got lost in the wilderness and has been wandering around this new colony for maybe two years or more, um, living with the natives and learning some of their medicines and techniques and lifestyles, and has finally found his way back into civilization, where the first thing he sees, of course, the, the, we don't know this yet as the reader, but the first thing he sees is his wife up on the scaffold for sleeping with some other guy. And we find out that Hester was not given the death penalty because her husband may in fact be dead. Of course he's not, but they don't know that. And of course if her husband were actually dead, she wouldn't be committing adultery, she'd just be having, you know, lustful sexual sin, but not um, adultery, which is much more punishable, and, and the Puritans would have punished that by death. And the stranger actually thinks that, no, this is a good punishment, because now she will be a living sermon against sin, because now for the whole rest of her life, people will see her and look at her. So we have this um, sort of acclamation from her husband that, no, this is, this is an appropriate punishment. But Hester's punishment isn't over. It's not enough to wear the letter. It's not enough to have been in jail. It's not enough to sit on the scaffold. But now they want to know the baby's father. And Hester refuses to give a name. Absolutely refuses. And they try everything. They try threatening her. They try bringing all these people in to talk to her, all of these learned people and, and strong ministers. And they even bring in Arthur Dimsdale, who's her own preacher. And we find out that he is young and compassionate and that, you know, again, Hester has been in his congregation. They've known each other. But Dimsdale can't get her to confess. And Hester is, and Dimsdale even tries and says, you know, this could be good for the father because your sin is open because of biology. You know, you got pregnant, we can tell that you've had this, that you've done this. But the father, biology is going not going to let him do that, that he will be able to hide his sin. And Dimsdale says, you know, you're letting this guy hide a guilty heart for life and add hypocrisy to sin and was trying to, you know, say this would actually be better for this father if you would name him. But Hester says, would that I could endure his agony as well as mine, which gives you the sense that Hester says I would take on his pain, this idea that Hester, whatever happened to whoever it is, is in love with her fa baby's father. Now, chapter four is called The Interview, and this is where Hester and Chillingworth come face to face and have this conversation. And after the scaffold and they go back in, Hester's all wild and crying, carrying on, and so is the baby. And probably not a surprise, they say the baby is kind of picking up on all of Hester's emotions. And so they call in this guy, Chillingworth, um, who's known to be a doctor to see if he can get them to calm down. And there's a fun little line here where he's examining the baby and he hands her back and says, here woman, this child is yours, she's none of mine. He's kind of twisting that knife a little bit there. And then, you know, he's left alone and is trying to help. And of course, Hester's worried that he's going to poison the kid or, you know, do something. And he says, nope, you know what? I'm not going to hurt the child. I'm actually, I'm it, part of this is my fault. Um, I should never have married you. I was old. I was kind of sick. I'm kind of ugly. And I picked you. You were young and beautiful. And I kind of doomed you to this life. And I knew, and you were honest with me, that you did not love me. And that this was not going to be a love match. And I still snatched you up and made you get married to me. And I probably shouldn't have done that. It's probably not surprising that, you know, you fell in love with somebody else and went off with somebody else. And then, of course, I left you alone. So, hey. Um, so he sort of says, you know what? We're we're even with each other. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have married you. And you shouldn't have cheated on me, but, you know, hey, it all washes out in the end. But the baby's father, this other guy who took what's mine, I'm going to get him. He's the one that I want. And he swears Hester to secrecy. Do not tell anybody who I am, and you owe me this. And she says, I will keep your secret as I have his. So now Hester has these two men in her life, and she can't say things about them to anybody, and is kind of caught in the middle of all of this. So as you look ahead at the next couple chapters, start thinking about what do you think Hester's life is going to be like now, now that she's through the punishment and is going back out into the world, what is it that Chillingworth is actually up to? How is he going to discover this father? What kind of revenge can he take? And what do you think life is going to be like as an outcast with this letter on her chest? Do you remember what it was like when you guys spent your day with your letter, with everyone um, you know, asking questions about it, but now what's this going to be like to have to be a single mom and a baby and not be accepted in society? So watch for more of that in the coming chapters, and that's the end.